To the English naturalist Mark Catesby, the American colonies were a new and exciting world of birds, plants, and mammals to be discovered and recorded. The two volumes of his great natural history grew out of sketches made on visits to the colonies, and Catesby himself engraved and colored the individual plates. Today, more than two centuries later, his flowers have not faded, nor his birds lost their lively beauty. in the spring of 1712 that my sister Elizabeth, after a sojourn in England, persuaded me to return with her to Virginia, to her Williamsburg home. The voyage was dreary, but her husband, Dr. Cock, met us at the port of Yorktown, and we drove on to Williamsburg through the wild splendor of the Virginia countryside. You wouldn't say so if one of them swooped down and snatched up a little pig. Mark, Mark, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but please don't stop again. We were all minded to get home, and Dr. Cock is a very busy man. Successful, too. This time is very valuable indeed. Oh, a man can do well here. Williamsburg isn't London, but it isn't Sudbury Town, either. I think we should have to put on our considering caps and find you a wife. One with a sufficient dowry. Property in town, I think, so I can have the good of your company. Dr. Cock is so often gone and tending the sick, and I'm so often left alone. Elizabeth, that bird, is it doing all those songs? Of course, it's a mockbird. It borrows from the whole choir. Are they a rare species? <laughs> No, common as measles. Amazing. I love you, Virginia. What a fresh and beautiful country. Well, I'm very glad you like it. But as I was saying... <laughs> but as I was saying, it's time you were feathering your nest. I didn't come to America in search of a wife, Elizabeth. Uh -huh. I'm far more curious about finding seeds and plants to send back home. Well, I didn't dream you could make a fortune at that. I can't. Well, then you'd better be looking out after yourself. I may have found my riches already. You're American birds. You're going to catch birds? Mm-hmm. In my own way.
was at my sister's house in Williamsburg, where I first tried my hand at drawing. My first sketches were without style, but I learned by doing. drawing a bird. Don't try to ridicule me. No, indeed, sir. A thousand pardons. I fear that my zeal to catalogue the natural beauties of your country has led me to invade your privacy. Hmm. What's your name? Mark Catesby, sir. Catesby? Then you'll be the brother of Mrs. Cock. And a sweet, pretty lady she is, too. Why didn't you say so? I'm Colonel William Bird of Westover. On the 24th of May was my great good fortune to be entertained at Westover, Colonel Bird's plantation on the James. My host, a many-sided man, shared my enthusiasm for natural history. What are you doing in the tree? So said I. I'm drawing a bird, says he. <laughs> By my soul, I thought he was being impertinent. <laughs> I had no mind to be drawn, for I was stripped down to my breeches and dancing my dance which warms my blood and frisks my spirit when press of business won't let me walk. But he was drawing a bird with feathers on it. <laughs> I knew you were collecting plants and seeds for the London botanists. Poor side venture of my own. Hasn't he shown you his sketches? No. I was not born a painter. My work's mere daubing, I fear. That's not true. Your sketch caught the look of a bird, not just its outline. I want to make them real. And there's only one way to do it. Each bird and animal, even the reptiles, must be painted alive. There's danger in that. No. Uh, have some punch, Dr. Cock. There's danger in that, too. <laughs> Pray go on, sir. I should like to do something that has never been done before. To paint both the bird and the plant it feeds upon in one and the same drawing. Good. It will double the instruction. And save paper. <laughs> Oh, I don't think I can drink all this. My fingers are numb already. We have a custom in Virginia. When the fingers become paralyzed, we hold the cup between the wrists. Try it. Splendid. You must practice it in private for a more graceful manipulation in the presence of ladies. <laughs> Come in, my dear lady. Thank you. No, I won't intrude. But I did want to inquire if my brother wouldn't join the ladies. Miss Harrison has the most enchanting voice. Later, if you will excuse me. I'm learning so much just now. Soon, then. 
Your servant, ma'am. What's that? Whip poor Will. Hear him saying it? Do you find its voice enchanting? <laughs> Not many do. If a whip or will cries near your dwelling, someone is supposed to die. Like the Banshee in Ireland. What was that? A barn owl. I could show you it's young if we dared keep the ladies waiting. Please do. Handsome barns. I'm in London and attend a meeting of the Royal Society, I shall commend your endeavours to Sir Hans Sloan. That's very kind of you, sir. Sir Hans is indebted to me for a Virginia possum and a rattlesnake. Oh, I should like to see them alive. They're unknown in our country. And I've never seen a raccoon. You shall see them. They are saucy fellows, but you shall see them all. <laughs> Call this the loblolly pine. It gives us good flooring. This is the magnolia from Carolina. It stays green the year round. It bears our loveliest flower. You'll have other days, the trees won't go away. Him? No, we'll come back this way. Let's press on. I should show you the swamp creatures in the early morning. time of year. Who's that boy? That's Pump. 
grumpy. I sent him ahead to find a hummingbird's nest. The birds feed in my garden, but I've never found a nest near the house. flies straight up and down, and from side to side, and backwards and forwards. Creatures love the marsh.
I'll give you some cherries. Summer Redbird. There's still another. Brown Thrasher, I think. Mockbird. Has he been drinking Virginia Punch? Cherry Bounce, I fancy. <laughs> Back away, slowly. No, spared it. That viper? Look at his eyes. Seen our dogwoods? Yes, I saw those the day I arrived. Perfection. We call this the sweet bay tree. It's a kind of magnolia. Virginia magnolia? You can bait a trap with its bark and catch a beaver. Oh, I should like to send it to England. A few are growing there already. The first was sent to Bishop Compton 25 years ago. Did you send it? No, though I sent the bishop a box of seeds two years ago. John Bannister sent him a sapling just before he died. By the by, what happened to Bannister? Killed in a hunting accident on the peaks of Otter when he was just about your age. No telling what he might have accomplished. We need a man to carry on his work. Look, the swallows have returned. Where they've been, nobody knows. 
Some say that during the winter they dive to the bottom of lakes and rivers and hibernate in the mud until the spring thaws them out. Do you believe that? No. Colonel Bird. Why don't you write a natural history? I wish I had the time. Would you illustrate it? Indeed I would. I've often thought about it. It ought to be done. There are thousands of plants in this country and hundreds of birds that go nameless. When you have enough of these sketches, don't wait for me. You'll find the words. Who knows? Maybe you'll be the one to tell us what becomes of the swallows in wintertime. Come along now. Like as not, we'll find another hummingbird in my garden. Virginians are hospitable people. If they like you, they don't want you to leave. So the visit to my sister in Williamsburg, begun in 1712, kept being extended indefinitely. traveled all over the Old Dominion, studying her birds and plants and flowers. On these trips, I often saw the laurel. Not only did I paint it, but I sent some of the plants back to England. I had a fair knowledge of gardening, and during my visits to Westover, Colonel Bird asked my advice on how to improve his garden. Through his good offices, I soon made the acquaintance of other gentlemen with similar interests. Among them, his brother-in-law, Mr. John Custis of Queen's Creek who gladly accepted my counsel. My sister Elizabeth was not so easy to please. Morning. Now what have you? I was going to ask you that. When I found it in bloom last summer, I marked it for transplanting. It appears to be a rare variety of daisy. It's just a black-eyed Susan. I shall send a clump of it back to England. Be an exotic there. Send it all. I don't want it in my garden. I want some more calendulas. Oh, these are finer than calendulas. But it's a weed. A weed, Elizabeth, is only a more self-reliant flower. And what a lovely name they have. Black-eyed Susan. Susan Martin. What? Black-eyed Susan. Now there's a girl the Martins would give a fortune to marry on. And she's a nice girl, too. I think I'll invite her to tea this afternoon. Oh, not on my account. I um, have an engagement with a fellow naturalist. Mr. Custis again? Take the gig. You can be back in time for tea. Oh, the carriage would frighten the forest creatures. Mark, only servants walk in Virginia. Then they have all the best of it. Anyway, I'm not going to Queen's Creek today. Do try to be back in time for tea. Yes, dear. And don't pile your clothes. No, dear. What fellow naturalist? I shall never forget that day. The birds, great and small, Disturbed by our presence, others all too easily frightened.
here that we found the flower I would rank next to the laurel and the sweet bay blossom, the Jamestown lily. While sketching, I noticed that we had neighbors. Near the river, we saw another bird that I greatly admired. No one knew its name. I call it the yellow-crowned night heron. Colonel Bird was very complimentary indeed. He spoke well of the sketches, and then he said, Are you known in London, Mr. Catesby? And of course, dear Mark said no. <laughs> Always so modest. And then Colonel Bird said, Well, sir, you will be. <laughs> Those were his very words. Oh, how much you are to be envied, the company of so clever a brother. <laughs> oh, thank you for the most enjoyable afternoon. You will not think me ungrateful, and I cannot stay any longer. Mother, he's coming. My respects to Mr. Catesby. I am sure he'll be here any moment. Do have another cup. You may perhaps find my brother a very quiet gentleman, reserved. But then so many true gentlemen are, don't you agree? Nonetheless genuine. Water lily. I felt much more comfortable in the Williamsburg garden of Mr. John Custis. He had left his Queen's Creek plantation after the death of his wife and was living with his children in his house in town. Well, I have missed you. Have you been off to Jamaica again? No, sir. I've been visiting John Clayton at New Windsor. I'm sure he knows more about botany than any man in Virginia. And I've never seen a garden better furnished with specimens. But for the beauty of its blossoms, there's none can rival yours. Your tulips are the talk of the town. Hmm. Well, save for my garden and my children, I've nothing to live for. You know, I had a hundred roots of fine Dutch tulips from a gardener in Battersea. But the ship was so late that all but three of them split themselves. Cost me a pretty penny. And 
If you send plants in boxes of earth, the ship's captains stow them down in the hold and never water them at all. Yes, I know the hazards. I sent home frogs and lizards, preserved in jars of spirits. The sailors drank off the rum. Seeds are the answer, but they take too long. Oh, I, I want Spanish broom and, and, and Guernsey lilies and yellow roses and laburnum. Oh, look what you could give in return. Roots from your fringe tree. The yellow wood. The tulip tree. You should have your counterpart in England. Some gentleman who would be happy to exchange plants with you. And no money involved. Mm. I'll do it myself when I return. I don't want you to go away. I want you to stay right here. You think the red buckeye would, would grow in England? I'm sure it would. But never the birds to go with it. Elizabeth always had a reason to keep me here. While Dr. Cock was in England on public business as secretary of the colony, I was needed to look after his private interests. I tried to be useful in the harvesting of tobacco, but found myself a novice compared to those worms and insects who were masters of the craft. Spring turned to summer, and summer to autumn. The swallows left us in great swarms, flying toward the equator in search of food for the coming winter. But I stayed on in Virginia, year after year. Mark? Lady Slippers. Oh, what beauties. And I walked right over them. <laughs> Lady Slippers, how appropriate. Oh, moccasin flowers. The doctor says the Indians use them to deck their hair. Elizabeth, I don't know what I'd do without you. You're not only my eyes, you're my teacher. So prodigious large. It's a possum. An opossum. <laughs> At last, an opossum. <laughs> well, the poor thing is dead. Oh, it's just playing possum. So where it's teeth? from that trap. Leave it alone. But it's an opossum. Don't care what it is. I caught it. I aims to shoot the head off any vomit that kills my chickens. You better not try. Leave it alone. Aren't you Jed Clary? Yes, ma'am. Well, my husband is Dr. Cock. And the next time your wife has the ague, don't come to us. Beg your pardon, ma'am. How was I to know a lady like you was possum-minded? 
Well, take the crit and welcome. Better put it in salt water overnight. Hard boil it and roast it with sweet taters. Drain off the fat when it's roasting. It's powerful greasy. It is fat. At least it's heavy. Oh, perhaps it's going to have young. <laughs> <laughs> my sister Elizabeth grudgingly allocated a corner of her garden to my pestiferous darlings, as she called them. I noticed a change coming over Elizabeth. humid weather returns, I think that surely it has never been so warm before. And I'm sure it has been. Do you suppose it is because the mind always tries to forget the previous discomforts of the, the body? Oh, yes. Yeah, I am. Yesterday I found a bead snake. Oh. Elegantly spotted. Bright reds and yellows, you know. A large one. But I managed to preserve it. Preserve this? In a jar. It took a quart of rum. Elizabeth is afraid I'm drinking in secret. I'd like to see it. Oh, no. No, thank you. I have something you would like. to say goodbye. Oh, where are you off to now? England. You belong in Virginia. I've received word if I go back to England now, the Royal Society may sponsor a book on your natural history. Write it then. Come back here and settle down. <laughs> you sound like my sister. <laughs> uh, she's been after me too, but uh, I'll never marry again. By the same token, my friends mean the world to me. Those who know gardening are doubly dear. We'll exchange plants if you like. I would indeed. Have these ever flowered? Not yet. You sure that the color was pink? Certain. As pink as a cabbage rose. 
The common dogwood in decay might have a reddish colour. He's a red-headed man, decayed. I tell you, they were pink. Well, then I hope they'll blossom. It would be a rarity. A rarity indeed. The parent tree is dead. These may be the only two in existence. And you brought them to me. Well, now, I take that very kindly. Very kindly indeed. Daniel, how could you do a discourteous thing like that? The target was provocative. I shall take this back to England and plant the seeds in my garden and send you some horse chestnuts in return. Your father will tell you that the best thing anybody can do with seeds is to plant them. If Mr. Sherrard and Sir Hans Sloan and all those other gentlemen from the Royal Society are going to send you right back to America, why do you have to go? I shall have to consult with them in person. And show them these. Well, I shall be counting the weeks until you return. I'm afraid any further exploring will be done in Carolina or Florida and the Bahama Islands. Oh, Mark, no. Please come back to us. If I can. Edwards. Yes. In England, we call them Virginia Nightingales. Now, where will you find anything more beautiful? I'll never forget Virginia. Nor my long-suffering sister. You're mistaken, Mark. You opened my eyes. I learned to love our trips through the fields and the woods. If there's anything you want, a bird or creature or flower, write to me for it. I don't suppose you'll ever get married now. But please try to take care of yourself. And send me your book when it's done. Twenty-six years went by before the book was completed. I was living in Fulham then, on the outskirts of London. Without a family of my own, I long depended upon the encouragement of fellow members of the Royal Society and my dear friend, Mrs. Rowland. Now there is the end of volume two, my dear Mrs. Rowland. All of it. Every last book. 156 sets. Oh. But you'll have more printed, won't you? I will not. 34,000 plates, with the little help I had, are quite enough to color in one lifetime. What will you do now? Well, I'm thinking of moving into London. Perhaps I'll get married. 
there's a nice little house in Old Street, just behind St. Luke's Church. Would be very comfortable for us. Are you sure you're old enough to know your own mind? Well, I'm only 64. <laughs> that should be just about right. You can't imagine how pleased Elizabeth will be. I wish you could meet her. I'd love to show you the view from my window in Williamsburg. <laughs> 